Okay, this is another um, sort of reading from page 34 of Berlinski's book, which kind of gets to the heart of the matter as far as um, the ultimate meaning of life goes. He's saying here, if universes as a science say it is, then what scope remains for statements about right or wrong, good or bad? What are we to say about evil and great wickedness? Whatever statements we might make are obviously not about gluons, muons, or curved space and time. In other words, those are just facts. The problem, the philosopher Simon Blackburn has written, is one of finding room for ethics or of placing ethics within the disenchanted, non-ethical order in which we inhabit. And of course, we are a part. Blackburn, of course, is convinced that the chief task at hand in facing this question, his chief task in any case, is above all to refuse appeal to a supernatural order. Now, of course, Berlinski finds that rather weird. It is a strategy that merits admiration for the severity of the mind it expresses. See, that's his satire. It is rather as if an accomplished horseman were to decide that his chief task were to learn to ride without a horse. If moral statements are about something, then the universe is not quite as science suggests it is, since physical theories, having said nothing about God, say nothing about right or wrong, good or bad. To admit this would force philosophers to confront the possibility that the physical sciences offer a grossly inadequate view of reality. And since philosophers very much wish to think of themselves as scientists, this would offer them an unattractive choice between changing their allegiances or accepting their irrelevance. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute. I don't know why, but it's common on both sides of the aisle. I don't know why the morality argument is occupying such a high place in on the Christian side or the theist side, claiming that we can't be moral if there's no God. That's essentially the theist position. The atheist position is morality exists apart from God. Now, it seems that these two sides, to me, it seems that both of these two sides are talking at each other. First, you have to start with a fact. Whatever science says about the universe, what science is saying are just, hi, these are the facts as we know them, or as we posit them or what we think they are so far. That's as far as science can go. Okay, science is not about, to me anyway, is not about and should not be about morality or ethics. In other words, when I'm, I do a lot of auditing for a living. When I'm auditing somebody's books, okay, I'm not technically engaged in looking for something good or bad. I'm just looking for what are the facts, all right? That's it. What are the facts? I'm not looking for right or wrong, good or bad, although that is the purpose of auditing, okay? When you audit your books or you audit your checkbook, <clears throat> the first thing you've got to do is find out what are the facts. That's where you have to start. Good or bad, right or wrong is a conclusion you can draw as a result of the facts, okay? You got to know what the facts are first. All right, so let me posit this question to you because, you know, I would beg you buy the book and read the rest of what he's saying here because he's talking about, he ends up talking about the problem of moral relativism. Okay, to me, that's not the way it, the argument ought to go. The whole moral question to me is, is not the right question. Okay, the first question above all is what facts do you have? All right, can you look at the facts you have 
and indirectly discern other facts. Like example, for example, in a bank transaction, okay, when I'm looking up bank transactions, I'm looking at asset statements. I'm looking at somebody's, you know, for a whole year, somebody's claiming that they spent or they got money, you know, into the account or out of the account. What I have to concern myself with is what money coming into the account, what was its source, what was its purpose, and if it leaves the account, what was its source, what is its purpose? Because I don't, I can't account for what happened during the year until I know all those things. And I have to know it with respect to every single penny. I don't know why we don't take that same approach here. Okay? Have we accounted for every single penny? Because whatever conclusions you draw about right or wrong, good or bad, are only as good as the facts you have. All right? If I'm looking at a bank account statement, and there are five or six transactions that don't make any sense or I don't know what they are, I can't say that that bank balance is right. I have to account for every transaction in and every transaction out, or I don't know right or wrong, good or bad. You see the point? And it seems to me that as if you're taking an atheist position or a theist position, you first have to say, look, have I accounted for all the facts? Because until I have, I don't know what's right or wrong, good or bad. I have to account for them. Now, the problem that both sides have is that the atheist cannot account for how the universe got here. He cannot account for how life began. The only thing he's got is middle data that even with the middle data he has, there are at least 11 or 12 different ideas, for example, on evolution. Okay, but it might not even be what's classified as evolution, it might not be evolution. It might be hybridization for one thing, which, you know, evolution by definition takes place over a long period of time. Okay, but what if it's hybridization? Well, then it's not evolution at all, and you're seeing successive iterations of hybridization taking over, taking place over a long period of time. Well, then you, you've got the wrong theory but you won't know it because you haven't accounted for all the facts. See, they, until science can come up with how did the universe get here? How did life get here out of inanimacy? In other words, matter and energy are inanimate. How did life come from that? It's a third element, as it were. If we're talking about constituent elements of the universe, you've got matter, energy, and life. Now, there is a something, there is something immaterial about life itself. Just speaking as a scientist, without having to invoke God, okay, there is something immaterial about the quality of life. Because you have an organism that one second is alive, the next second is dead, but all of its biological parts are still there. One minute they're working, and the next minute they're, they're not working. In other words, you can go out to your garden and you can cut a bunch of herbs or flowers. And the minute you cut them, they're dead. But they're still in your hand. They're still flowers. They still have all their constituent parts. They're just no longer alive. So where did that life come from? Okay. Essentially, the, what we call life is a kind of moving around. Okay. A bunch of things, you know, you've got cells that are moving and that's why you're alive. And the cells stop moving. Okay, but do the cells of a, of a plant that you just cut, they didn't stop moving yet. But yet they're dead because they're cut off from the source of what makes them alive. You see the point? If you can't account for the beginning of a thing, and especially if the beginning of a thing is obviously neither matter nor energy, but immaterial, then you don't know what's right or wrong, good or bad. The same thing is true in theology. Theology basically posits in whatever flavor, God made this happen. Okay, but that doesn't tell you right or wrong, good or bad. It's going to turn on what's the character of, a, of this alleged God who made it happen, and what, a, what about the way in which it was made to happen according to the sect or faith or whatever. Okay, that's a secondary concern, but... It's a secondary concern only after you have all the facts. 
if a faith about God doesn't account for all the facts, all right, and just saying God did it isn't enough, then you're now dealing with not only the facts of the universe, but you're dealing with the facts about this alleged God. Until you've accounted all the facts, you don't know right or wrong, good or bad. So we're not in a position to evaluate, you know, uh, ethics. See, finding room for ethics. We're not in a position to evaluate them. It's not a question of whether morality exists. Morality exists even among animals. Okay, but what ought, and he gets into this in this chapter, what ought morality to be, if God exists, what ought God to be? Because if you don't evaluate that, you still don't have all the facts. You see what I'm saying? So I I understand where he's going with this, and he, he the rest of this chapter are called this still small voice. He's making a play on a, a, a verse in uh, the Old Testament. Um... I understand where he's going with this. He's talking about, well, c can you really ultimately be moral if there's no God? And that's a common argument that theists make. Atheists, of course, contending that, yes, you can be moral without God. But to me, that's not even the proper question. If moral statements are about something, then the universe is not quite as science suggests it is. Well, yeah, okay, fine. But if, until you can account for how the universe got here, until you can account for this immaterial property called life, because life itself is neither matter nor energy, but it but drives matter and energy. Until you can account for life, what life is, then you don't. You, you, all your claims about everything is just middle data, and you can't be conclusive at all. Period. Now the theist will step into the gap and say, "Well, God did it." And therefore, because God now exists, now we have right or wrong, good or bad. Well, that doesn't follow either. Okay? And he even hints at this problem here. Let me show you, because this was the point of my audio. Um, right here. To the question of what makes the laws of moral life true. See, he's dealing with the life thing. Okay? you you got to count for how life get here. Atheist or theist, that's our job. How did life get here? Okay, then after we can figure out what life is, then we can answer the question of what morality is. Okay? And so he's saying he's coming from a presupposition of moral life, that it exists by his own definition, whatever that is. To this question of what makes the laws of moral life true, there are three answers. In other words, what makes moral life true? Does God make moral life true? Does logic make moral life true? Or does nothing make moral life true? And his argument is each of these answers is inadequate. If moral life reflects the will of God, then he might presumably change his mind or tomorrow issue a new set of commandments encouraging rape, plunder, murder, or the worship of false idols. Many devout men and women <coughs> would say that this is his perfect right, he is God after all. But if tomorrow God were to encourage rape as a very good thing, would rape become a very good thing? Or would we conclude, along with Richard Dawkins, that considering his poor life choices, meaning God's, God is a repellent figure and to hell with them. Okay? That's a valid atheist argument right here. I'd like to see atheists discuss this more because you can't, you guys cannot prove how life got here. You can't prove how the universe got here. All you can do is guess. All right. You can't audit it and prove it like a set of books. You don't have all the facts. Okay. And the theist also doesn't have all the facts. What we do as theists is we say, well, God is in the gaps. You've heard that before, okay? And then it's a question of, well, what about the sovereignty? If God is determining everything, the atheist will counter, then <clears throat> morality is simply his own opinion of morality. Whatever we think morality is, 
is really subjective based on God's own opinion of it. And if God, as it were, changed his mind tomorrow, we wouldn't know the difference. We'd just go right along because we would have the same values. In which case, God is a repellent figure and to hell with him. So now, for the atheist, the question turns on, we can't account for the facts. So then you can't account for the morality. If you can't account for all the facts, all the transactions in the, in the checkbook of how the universe got here and how it operates, then you can't account for morality or life either. Therefore, your <clears throat> argument is based on some kind of faith or supposition, which is the same thing, about what the facts are. You're stuck with the unknown, and you have to fill the gap with a supposition. The theist is filling the gap with God. The problem of doing that is then what kind of God? See, that's what it turns on. It's either the character of your supposition or it's the character of God depending on how you account for how everything got here, got here. All right? Now, if you say, well, God, then it's going to turn on his particular moral character. All right? And that's a valid question atheists should debate right here. I, that's, that's a valid question to debate. My problem with the atheist side of the debate on this is that they don't actually do their homework when they're trying to argue that the God of the Bible is repellent. They're not really doing their homework properly and they kind of make fools of themselves every time they think they find something morally repugnant in the Bible. Okay? So you guys got to clean up your act with respect to your claimed research. I'm not saying Christians are better. I'm saying that if you want to <clears throat> support a position that claims that, th that God is immoral, then you need to do your homework better in the Bible because you're not. All right, and this, especially this is true of Dawkins. Okay, he doesn't he doesn't even know how to read the Bible, so you know he loses credibility with me on that ground alone. Okay, if you got a book that has all kinds of scholarship behind it, that has all kinds of lexicons and everything, where you can actually learn to read it in the Hebrew and Greek, so that you know what kind of text you're looking at. And if you don't do that, then you're a not scientific, b not being objective, c not seeking the truth. And D, you're being dishonest. Okay? Now, the next question, though, is, and this is debated among Christians, particularly the Calvinists, <clears throat> if, on the other hand, God chooses the right or good because it is right or good, then the power of his imperative, the power of God's own imperative, has its source in the law. This is a chief argument of Calvinists and is not in his will. Calvinists assert God is sovereign, but at the same time they claim that, that God is picking something objectively moral, objectively good, as if the goodness of a thing derived its goodness outside of God. And of course, philosophy has been making this argument for a long time. Let's look at this again. If, on the other hand, God chooses the right or the good because it is right or good, meaning it has an objective existence of being right or good apart from God, then the power of God's imperative has its source in that law, not in his will. Okay? That's a problem. Okay, and this is what, what Berlinski's getting at, see? He's saying we got moral, moral life. We got three answers, God, logic, and nothing. Okay, for logic, he's he's basically introducing the idea of logically something right or good logically existing outside of God that God chooses okay then the power of his imperative God's has its source in the law and not in his will okay so then God must be demoted to a constabulary role in other words, he's just there to enforce good and evil that exists apart from him. Well, then the good and evil that exists apart from him is not God, and therefore, you know, um, he's subordinate to it. See, 
having no hand in creating the moral law, God is occupied in enforcing it. Logic prevails, see? Or if not logic, then something in the laws of right and wrong that enforces their binding sense. This is an attractive position, one that philosophers will wish to embrace, since it preserves in some sense of a moral order without compromising their consensual position that their chief business is to decline an appeal to supernatural order. Remember what Blackburn was saying earlier. In other words, and, and this is true for a lot of theists, they don't like the idea, or that makes them very nervous, okay, that God, if God has the right to issue the commandments himself and say, well, this is what good is by my definition, then what if he changes his definition? See? If he were to encourage rape as a very good thing, would rape become a very good thing? Or would we conclude that God is repellent? You see? This makes everybody nervous. If God says a thing is good, how would I know otherwise? Because I'm made by God then. Or B, what if he changes the rules after I exist? And I have initially moral value set A, and now he makes it moral value set minus A. Okay, what does that say about God? Nothing good. And what does that say about life? Well, you wouldn't want to live it. Okay, but then if, on, on the other hand, God didn't create the right or the good, but is just there to, like, support it, then he's a constable, all right? And then that right or good law would be above God. And that's attractive to somebody who wants to hold an atheist position because then there is a decline, you know, refusal to appeal to a supernatural order. In other words, the, the what you have to call supernatural anyhow, the existence of the laws of right and wrong are like the existence of the laws of math, and they're just inanimate, and they're just there, and they just rule everything, and our happiness lies in supporting them. Yeah, but see, again, this is the problem. How do they get there? If you can't account for how they get there, then you can't account for the morality. You see? And then, of course, as he covers on the next page, if you can't say God did it, therefore God can change it, and we're, you know, then we're like at God's mercy for what right and wrong, good and bad is. If you can't account for it as logic, meaning these pre existent, immaterial, non personal laws exist instead that God serves rather than, you know, creates, then where do those laws come from? Okay? Because then you don't know what morality is anyhow. And then the third argument he's making is nothing. There's nothing that creates anything. Of course, if you've got nothing, then, you know, morality is anybody's, everybody says own God, and morality is what anybody determines, moral relativism. Okay, so, you know, like so many other positions, moral relativism has been promoted from the back of the college classroom to its podium. Okay, well, that's just based on consensus. So if it's consensus that it's moral to kill all the Jews, which is where he's going with this, then that's what society's going to choose and call themselves moral for doing it. Well, but then... Is that actually moral? You see? So, I mean, in the final analysis, the first problem that, you know, is needs to be dealt with is do you have all the facts about how the universe got here and specifically what is life? Because it's not matter and it's not energy. All right? 
Until you know the answers to those questions, you can't even talk about right or wrong, good or bad. You can't talk about morality. All right? And once you start talking about morality, then you get into this question about if moral life is true, then either God did it, there are a set of impersonal laws, or there's nothing. Each is inadequate as an answer. Now, each is inadequate as an answer, period. Because really, there's a question even beneath this. All right? Why are we saying, if the universe of science say it is, then what scope remains for statements about right or wrong, good or bad? Why is that the question? Why do we need to find a room for ethics at all? The universe exists. Where are we getting our, our sense of moral values? That's a typical argument on both sides of the aisle, atheists and theists. My question to you is, why is this relevant? I'm dead serious. Why is right or wrong, good or bad, relevant? I'm not saying there is no relevance. I'm asking why is it relevant? Because if you don't know why it's relevant, all right, then this question here, see, this question here can't even be evaluated. You see, it's saying, hi, facts. we got to get the facts. We don't have enough facts. All right? Science can't tell you those facts in completeness. Okay? And even when it does, science isn't telling you anything about God, right, wrong, or bad. So science can only tell you its ideas about what the facts are on the ground, and it's always incomplete. And it particularly cannot address the beginning and the ending. It can't say where everything came from. Okay? The theist just puts God as the origin. Because it can't say where everything came from either. All right? And then, for some reason, the human race gets into, well, what about right and wrong? Where does that come from? And my question to you is, why should it be there? Why is the question of right or wrong, good or bad, relevant? Now, here's my answer that I will put to you that I don't see anybody covering. Right or wrong, good or bad, are, are important for only one reason. Social intercourse amongst, what do you want to call it, sentient beings. This... Right or wrong, good or bad, has no relevance except for living together. You see the point? Living together. If you and I have a relationship and we care about each other, we're going to care very much about right or wrong, good or bad, because we want to treat each other well. So you notice that the impetus for morality which therefore means that you don't have to have God exist in order for morality to exist. The impetus for morality is fellowship. Let me say that again. The impetus for morality is fellowship. Animals congregate in their own little societies. They have certain rules about morality too. Why? Because they're living together. The reason why right and wrong, good and bad matter, and the only valid reason for them to matter, is I live with you and you live with me. And we want to live together. We're all on the same planet. We're all in the same country. We're all in the same neighborhood. We're all in the same apartment complex or apart, you know, housing community. Therefore, right or wrong matters because we want to figure out ways of dealing and living with each other. Okay? So right or wrong, morality only matters to the extent that you want to have fellowship with your other beings. Okay. So this whole business about moral statements, 
Science can't address that because these are choices people make about how to live together. Science also can't say anything about God because it, it, it's all, you know, you can't prove God's existence by, the me, by means of non-God toys. Okay? Therefore, science can say nothing about right or wrong, good or bad. Why? Because this is a fellowship question. So, the God question has to deal with fellowship, not, oh, moral, immoral, amoral. In other words, you got facts, one of which is, does God exist or not? That has to be determined first. And then, if God, or if not God, how do we live together? Only thirdly does the question of right or wrong, good or bad, become relevant. So before you can even get to morality, you first have to know the facts about how the universe got here. The existence or non-existence of God would be a fact that's just a fact as part of the universe. God exists or doesn't. The universe exists or doesn't. How did the universe get here? Those are all facts. They have nothing to do with whether you like those facts or whether those facts are even moral. Do they exist? And then if they exist, then you're getting into the question of, well, how do I live with those facts? And thirdly, then, how do I want to live together, want to live together with those facts? That's where you get into morality. Only then. Anyway, I don't know if I made any sense signing off.